Uh, welcome to online service today. Um, I just want to thank you for following us and uh, we are glad you've chosen to listen to our messages. Thank you for doing that. May God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you. We thank you for everything. We thank you that you are God. We thank you for the love you have shown to us. We thank you that without you we can't do anything. And with you we are more than conquerors. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for this wonderful love that you have given us. We, we thank you that we are here because of you. We are here to hear your word. We are here so that our hearts would be comforted. God, the one who speaks to us, comfort our hearts. Saying, I will never leave you. Loving God, hear us. Faithful God, be near us. Holy God, renew us in the image of Christ by your spirit power today and always. Amen. I would uh, welcome my brother, Ben, to come and read the word of God from the book of Mark chapter 6, verses um, 14 to 29. The gospel of Mark chapter 6, verses 14 to 29. Praise God, and uh, another beautiful day here in Atherton. And I uh, just, uh, isn't it beautiful how Johnson calls me brother? And I think that's just amazing. And in, in, in Mark, actually, it talks about how Jesus said, who are my real brothers and sisters? And Jesus said, those that are, obey God's commands, you know. Um, and so if Johnson's Jesus' brother and I'm Jesus' brother, that makes us brothers. And that makes me and Johnson brothers with you guys as well, so... Remember that, that uh, we're, we're a family and, and a true family, a family that will be living together for eternity. But anyway, aside from that, we've got an exciting verse today. As Johnson mentioned, Mark 6, 14 to 30, 29, sorry. So King Herod heard about this for jesus name had become well known some were saying john the baptist has been risen from the dead and that is which is why miraculous powers are at work in him others said he is elijah and still others claimed he is a prophet like one of the prophets of long ago but when herod heard this he said john whom i beheaded has been risen from the dead for Herod himself has given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted, him, wanted to kill him. But she was not able to, because Herod feared John and protected him knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly when Herod heard John he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally the opportune time came. On his birthday Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, Whatever you ask, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried into the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oath and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Wow. 
Anyway, we'll get Johnson back to share his message for this week. It's um, yeah, going to be an interesting one. And uh, yeah, come with open ears. God bless you. Thank you so much for the reading of the word. Let us pray. We praise you, living God, for, the, for those whom you call to be prophetic voices in a world that is not listening to any other voice. For those who speak out about injustice. For those who speak to our churches words of truth, challenge, and inspiration. May we have ears to hear what you to say to us and the hearts willing to respond in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I've decided to share with you on a theme, don't give in to peer pressure. Don't give in to peer pressure. Let us take a look at the story with me. John has been arrested by King Herod. And why? Because John kept reminding Herod that even the king is not above the law. He said, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So this was the king's horrific sin. He had stolen his brother's wife, Herodias. Now it would be understandable if this way the story ended. The king didn't like a desert preacher calling him a sinner. So he had been beheaded. Simple enough. But life is not always simple. There is usually more to a story than meets the eye. And in this case, we learn that Herod actually liked to listen to John. Thought he was a holy man and protected him. Perhaps in Herod's mind, putting him under lock and key was a way of removing him from the harm's ways. So if the king was offended by John's outburst, it was not enough to warrant death. So the king feared the prophet and dared not to harm him. But life was a funny way of pressuring him pressurizing him and us to do what we would not normally do. Sometimes life pressures us, we end up doing the wrong thing. This is a story about a man who caved due to social pressures. Let me ask you, how do life's pressures affect your judgment? What can we learn from the deplorable moment in the life of the king? This moment when the king kept in, we learn first that puzzling problems require diligent decisions. I found that most of the answers we apply to the problems in life are at best only the second and third best answers. They are not the first. Why is this? It is because we don't want to address puzzling moral dilemmas head on. Because it makes facing them head on look at Herod. He couldn't address it as he was supposed to do. He finds himself in a difficult situation. He has made an off, which according to the cultural and legal customs of the time, he must keep to it. But keeping the oath means killing a man of God. Does he keep the oath or execute the prophet? Now it appears that he is confronted with two choices. And it seems obvious that the best possible answer to break this off and save the man of God. But this is not the best answer to the issue. The best answer is to get rid of his wife. Herodias. Not because he's a source of contention, but because he's not his wife. That is the best answer. He was supposed to let her go. When you find yourself in a puzzling moral dilemma, it is wise a thing to look at what got you into that dilemma in the first place. What warning did you not heed? King Herod's problem is that he would not heed the original warning. When this happens, we slowly wake out our way into the woods and no point of coming back. Finally, we are lost. 
We do not know what got us there in the first place. Is the ish my wife? Is the ish the oath I make? Is the ish that you don't persecute holy men? No, the ish is this to always be the first one. You are in an adulterous relationship. You have stolen your brother's wife and you must repent. That was the issue. That was the issue you didn't want. So this brings us to the second lesson. Promises made in a haste create great waste. Promises and decisions made in a haste. They will bring down empires. Top of kings destroy businesses, destroy churches, ruin marriages, cripple lives, drive wages between us and our children. These decisions can hound us for years to come because you made these promises without thinking. When Herod heard about Jesus and all that he was doing, he said, John, the man I beheaded has been raised from the dead. Herod thought that God had brought John back to life to get him because of what he's done. He knew his legs were wrong and they hang around his neck and unable to escape. I, I think at night when he was sleeping, he had these dreams of about John coming to him, trying to haunt him. What got Herod in this predicament? Like any good story, it was a pretty girl. But this was no ordinary girl. This was his wife's daughter. His stepdaughter. Who either because the veils and her identity or the king simply had never met her, was able to deceive the king. He was so pleased with her provocative dance that he promised her anything. She raised out, consult her mother, and then makes the damaging request before the king and all the guests. I need the head of John the Baptist in a platter. <laughs> I need the head of John the Baptist. What a request. A head of John the Baptist. What will you do with it? On a special day like that. I suppose that Herodias felt embarrassed by John. That's why he told her daughter to say, request for the head of John the Baptist. He would not stop pointing out their sin, so she fixes the scheme to hang John. History does not record us what happened to their marriage after this incident. But I can assure you that their marriage was never a bed of roses. After this, something would have happened. Whatever their situation, it is obvious that the king's conscience bothered him thereafter. What a waste. A marriage is destroyed by a covetous, powerful brother. A mother uses a daughter in a murderous scheme. Can you see the things that were happening within the family? A preacher is killed. A king commits murder to save his honor of a stupid oath. What a waste all because of a powerful man was not able to see his original error and makes a promise in a haste. This brings us to the, our third and final lesson. Pressures in life can affect good judgment. Now let me tell you, it doesn't matter your station in life. All of us experience pressures that they come at us every day of our lives. And these pressures will influence the decisions we make. Some of these decisions will affect us for all, the whole of our life. Lloyd Ogliffe, in his book, Life Without Limits, tells the story of a pastor who in the space of one week heard the following comments from various people. A young pastor at a pledge conference said, I hardly know who I am anymore. There are so many points of view in my congregation. I can't please them all. Everyone wants to capture me for his camp and get me to shape the church around his convictions. The pressures making me want to leave the ministry. These are all pressures coming from different points. All this is common in life. He is being pressured by other people. Well, we all at one time or another experience people pressure. The question is, how will it affect our judgment when we are facing all these pressures? That is the question Herod faced. 
After making an oath to a pretty young girl that she could have up to half of his kingdom, she surprised him and asked for the head of the Baptist. In Mark 6, verse 26, it indicates that the king was thrown into distress. He knew it was wrong, but because of his oath and his dinner guest, he did not want to refuse him. He said the executioner on a platter was delivered the head of a holy man before them on that special birthday. <laughs> oh, the head of someone in the platter. When you find yourself in the middle of difficult situation, one which requires you to make an important decision, remember first that puzzling problems requires diligent decisions. And second, promises made in a has create great waste. And find out that the pressures of life can affect good judgment. Amen to that church. Amen to that. Pressures of life can affect good judgment. If you are not very careful. It is called peer pressure. Some call it peer pressure coupled by a gang mentality. When everyone is doing it, others just go along with the flow. If they don't, they can be ostracized, ridiculed, or made a victim for themselves. When most of us think of peer pressure, we think maybe the age to have the most stylish clothes, like the other kids at school, or expensive, or perhaps for adults, to have the latest car, or as expensive a house as a friend, as a good job as a brother, as a fence garden as a neighbor. To one extent or another, none of us are spared this kind of everyday pressure to compare, compete, and conform. We always find ourselves in those issues. But when it becomes obsessive, it becomes danger, dangerous and deadly. deadly. In Herod's case, it had to do with the number of things that he has to face. First and foremost, the honor of his word given to Herodias' daughter in front of his important, high-powered guests. Most of them, no doubt, none Jews. He wanted to keep it because he had important guests. Then there was the pressure of the woman in his life. He wouldn't want to look weak or a coward before this beautiful woman. So there was the flow of the evening, the going of the guests themselves, who may have aged him on, drank on wine, and the dancing of his daughter. He had protected John from his wife up until this time. He knew John was a holy man, and Herod was a Jewish. And he knew that what he was doing was wrong. But with his guest, his wife, his daughter, his fellow politicians looking on, what could he do? Herod bears the responsibility of giving the order that took John's life. Peer pressure today is not just found in school. Or in the playground or even in the workplace. It's found in our culture. Just look what is happening. If something started in America, the Australians will say, why can we not do like what the Americans are doing? If something is happening in Canada, they'll say, why can we not do like what the Canadians are doing? If something is happening in the UK, they say, why can we not do like what the British are doing? It's peer pressure. They are not doing it because they, made it, they are saying others are doing it. So peer pressure is even found in governments. This is what it is. How many of us they call ourselves a Jesus follower when Christians are being mocked at every day? How many of us want to show that we are Christians? How many declare Jesus in the public square? Today is not cool to be a Christian. Not cool to be heaven bound. <laughs> when you talk about heaven, they say you're crazy. It's not something cool. And that's why you find our young people, they cannot reveal who they are. Their identity is that they're Christians. Because they feel that they will never be called cool. Because it's not cool. They want to be called cool. So that they flow with everyone. It was peer pressure that allowed Herod to fail John. It was peer pressure that allowed for Jesus to be crucified. 
It was peer pressure that caused Peter the rock to wimp out and betray Jesus three times. It was peer pressure that allowed for men of the atrocities in human history. It's peer pressure. It was peer pressure in our society today that ages us not to follow Jesus Christ, not to believe in the living Christ. It is peer pressure that ages us to doubt the resurrection, to falter in our faith in healing power, to crucify him again in our towns and in our hearts every day. And yet, Jesus will always be resurrected. Jesus will always have a church. The question is, will it be this one? The question is, are you part of the church that Jesus is calling? Will it be ours? Who are the Herodians in your life today? In your church? Who are the people who tell you it's not cool to believe in God? That is a waste of time to go to church. Because there are so many other things you could do with that one hour. How many people are causing you to do that? It could be your own children. They are calling you to go maybe to the beach in the morning, early mornings of Sunday morning. It could be your friends. They are saying, let's go and have a party. That you don't need to go to Bible study. You don't need to go to prayers. You don't need to have communion with others. You help that ministry. You don't need to help whatever is happening because there are enough people to do it. It doesn't do any good anyway. Who are the people in your life and in your church who perhaps without even realizing have become your peers instead of your sisters and brothers in Christ? <laughs> They've now become your peers. If you don't want anything in the church, you corroborate together. If you don't want anything to happen, you come together. What would have happened if Herod got in the chance to talk it over first? and the Jewish companions? What if he had stood up to that secular crowd? What if he had had John's ways to begin with and had married his brother's wife? What would have happened if, jo if Herod had listened to this? We have a lot of what if in our lives. But it's time for us to make so what? So what should we do? While we live within the world, we don't live of the world. We are in the world, but not of the world. We, we don't got the standard of the world. Being a Christian today is even perhaps harder than being in many years in our society. And while we remain part of the world, we need to find more and more ways to stand tall and find our identity in Jesus Christ. Because we are Christians. Where is our identity? The more we refuse to let our identity be forged and fired by the world, instead allows Jesus to form his identity within us and through us, the more we'll be able to stand up to the radiance of this world, to the radiance of this world, and to go to the different path, the narrow path that is followed by few. You need to stand up. Jesus told us following will not be easy. It requires to pick up a cross and carried through the streets, filled with people, those who mock us, those who jeer, those who laugh, those who doubt. But we know as Christians, little Christ, that when we go to the end of the road, our lives won't be hounded by wrong paths we took, but blessed by Jesus Christ, because he is the author of life, one we follow every day of our life. He's the Alpha and Omega of our life. Let's face it, one of the most powerful motivators in life is what will my friends think if I do this? What will my peers think? We counsel our young people, we don't give, don't give in to peer pressure. Just because everyone else is doing, is using drugs, doesn't mean you should use drugs. Just because the popular kids in your school are having casual sex, doesn't mean it's health or it's right for you to do. It's not. Well, there are different kinds of peer pressure. Let's face it though. It takes a lot of character on the part of a young person sometimes to say no. It needs character for you to say no, to stand up and say no to what you believe. I, I want to tell you a story from Chuck Swindle. He tells about the start of teenagers and peer pressure. The design of the study was simple. They brought groups of 10 adolescents in a room for a test. 
which group was instructed to raise their hands when the teacher pointed to the longest line on three separate charts. What one person in the group of ten did not know was that the other nine had been instructed ahead of time to vote for the longest line, but for the second longest line. Do you get the picture? Regardless of the instructions they had, once they were together in the group, the nine were not to vote for the longest line, but rather vote for the next to the longest line. This left the 10th student being the only one who would be voting for the longest line. Guess what happened? Time after time, this 10th student would glance around, frown in confusion at the way the others were voting, and slips his hand up with the group. The instructions were repeated and the next card was raised. Each time, the self-conscious stooge would sit there saying a short line is longer than a, a long line. Simply because he lacked the courage to challenge the group. This remarkable conformity occurred in about 75% of the cases and was true of small children and high school students as well. So it's hard to say no to the crowd and becoming an adult doesn't make it much easier. You may know the story of a woman who was interviewed by reporters on her 102 birthday. When asked what was the best thing about passing the century mark, she answered, no peer pressure. No peer pressure. Adults are often as susceptible to peer pressure as are young people. What professional doesn't, doesn't want to impress his or her co colleagues? Why do we throw big man in our weddings in the first place? to impress our friends? Why do we buy expensive cars, build large homes? It's because we, we care that other people think of us. Some people go into debt for years to make a favorable impression on their friends because they want to be seen. Spiritual maturity comes when you are more interested in pleasing God than pleasing people. That means that doing the right thing rather than the expedient thing. This is an avoidable principle found in his teaching. It's more important to please God than to make a good impression on your friends. You need to please God. It's more important that God thinks of you than what your friends think of you. In the long run, doing the right thing will make the best impression. All of us encounter some peer pressure in our lives. What do you do with these peer pressures? In conclusion, all of us are susceptible to peer pressure. Peer pressure just, does, isn't just for teenagers. Even college professors who thought to know better are susceptible to peer pressure within their colleagues. And so we are. All of us. Let's face it. The opinion of others to a certain extent de determines the kind of house we live in. The car we drive, the clothes we wear, even our political opinion. When we are going to cast our votes, we are working with our friends and they are saying, who are you going to be voting for? They are already tuning you to vote for someone. Learning to say no, no to bullies, no to common cruelties, no to demeaning social conventions, no to all-consuming appetizing. No has ever been a word to learn. Not an easy word to learn. How are you at speaking up or speaking out against the mass mind, whether the mass consists of the popular crowd in high school, or the scheming and shaking and sneaking crowd at work. So here is my question for you this morning. Why is it hard, as hard as it is for all of us to say no to the people around us? Whether out of love or out of fear, it seems that we can always find it ourselves to say no to God. Why is it hard that we can say no? We can't say no to the crowd, but we can say no to God. Why is it that we find it easy to say no to God and difficult to say no to others? Why is it that we have more trouble saying yes to God than to others? These are the questions I want you to answer. Second, you need to surrender your life to Christ.
You need to give everything you are to everything to God. Receive Jesus in your mind. Receive Jesus in your heart. Receive Jesus in your body. Receive Jesus with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength, that you may be Jesus in the world. Grace is nothing more, nothing less than Jesus entering your life, a royal blood transfusion, and you're becoming part of Jesus' ongoing love. When Jesus is part of your life, you don't count the crowd. You stand alone. Jesus is either with you, your entire being, or is not. If he is then, then surrender all. Don't offer him divided heart. Of course, our hearts are always divided, deceitful, desperately wicked. None of us keep all our promises. But we ask for a whole heart and a divided heart and with the homage of our heart. That's what we are asking. Third, you need to say yes to God means you will be maligned and persecuted for saying no to some of the dictates and direction, dictates and directives of the world. You are able to say no to certain things. When we lay down our hammer negative towards God, we will get nailed by the world. And this demand for com conformism and this brand for loyalties. Those are the things we will say no to those things. Saying yes to God often means saying no to the crowd and to the culture. <laughs> Isn't that great? Saying no to God, saying yes to God, often means you are saying no to the crowd. You are saying no to the culture, no to your friends, no to your neighbors. Just because other people say a certain line is longer of the two lines doesn't make it so. Can you be popular and be a Christian? To a point, but sometimes you will face a situation in which you have, you have to make a choice is to be made. In such a situation, I hope you always choose Jesus Christ as your number one. Herod did not want to kill John the Baptist, but he gave the order so that he wouldn't be embarrassed in front of his guest. How easy it is to give in to the crowd to let ourselves be pressured in doing wrong. Don't get in a situation where it will be too embarrassing to do what is right. Determine to do what is right, no matter how embarrassing, how painful it is. Do the right thing, always. Why? Because you are a follower of Christ. Don't let your life be pressurized by anyone else. You are an individual, created in the image of God. Stand up for Christ. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Soldiers of Christ. In Jesus' name, I come to you. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you. We thank you for the love you have for us. We know that we are living in a world where we are being pressurized every day. Pressurized to do things wrongly or in a different way. We pray for our church, our home, our neighborhood and the struggles we are having in centering our lives on the love of God. We offer into God's care the situations and people with whom we struggle. We pray for areas of the world where Christians face persecution. We pray for ourselves when we face situations where standing up for the rights is hard and painful. We pray for people who find themselves alone, for all who suffer, naming them before God and trusting God's faithfulness. Be with us, Lord Jesus Christ, as we stand up for the right thing and right decisions in this world that is falling apart. Bless us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me take our offering time. Brothers and sisters, this is an opportunity for us to make our offering and thank God for who God is. I urge you and encourage you to take this opportunity just to, to look around at what God has done to you. And just come about and say, I, I think I need to say thank you, God. 
I'm not pressurizing you to do it. But I'm saying, think about it. If you find that God is doing something in your life, it's always good to say thank you. As we are taking our offering, think about what God has done in your life and what you want to see happening in the church in the future. Let us pray for our offering. Heavenly Father, we bring our offerings before you. For there is no one, no one we, we can offer these sacrifices. This is our whole sacrifice of saying thank you, Lord, for what you've done in our lives. And we continue to worship you. We continue to praise you. We continue to honor you. Even when we find ourselves in difficult circumstances, we still come before you and say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us receive grace. Heavenly Father, as we come to the end of this service, we just want to thank you. Blessed be the God of, of our Father, Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ. You have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. You have believed, go and live to praise of his glory. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. God bless you all. In Jesus' name, amen.